Okay, it's Alan Boyle. We're on a LinkedIn Live today with Eric uh, Elberser, and he's coming to us from the City of Tribes, from Galway. Um, so we are live at five, and today we're talking about all things product management, product development. I'm really interested in this uh, space, spe specifically as you move from scale up or startup into scale up and beyond. And uh, Eric brings a wealth of exper um, experience with him. So I'm just going to go through a quick bio, and then Eric will will give you the opportunity to introduce yourself. Uh, so he's the founder and CEO of Ancient Oak Ventures, and we've got to find out how what that means and where the name came from. So that's going to be my first question. Um, he's a business consultant, which helps scale tech companies through the development of their business strategy and product management skills and processes. So I like the process bit. He has 35 years experience in the ICT sector, 20 of those in various senior global leadership uh, positions with uh, Cisco and Nortel, and key roles have included global director of product management and user experience and global director of solutions for various, a variety of Cisco uh, product portfolios. So um, we'll get into that. And um, Eric, welcome. And uh, tell us a little bit, firstly, Ancient Oak Ventures. Talk to us about that. Sure, yeah. And and great to be here, Alan. Uh, thanks very much for having me on the Live at Five show. Um, hopefully we've got loads of folks tuning in. So Ancient Oak, um, where the name comes from really is kind of a couple of connotations. Uh, I've got two sons, Dara and Kian, And so part of it is a connotation with their names. Uh, Dara is an Irish name, uh, which means oak, actually. And Kian, uh, again, sort of a traditional name associated with, with old and ancient. But also, and the, the thing that I particularly like and why hopefully it's appropriate, I think there's this association of an ancient oak, you know, the big old oak tree with wisdom and um, knowledge, you know, and wisdom and knowledge that, that, that comes from that. So hopefully, you know, that's something that I can impart and, and share with uh, my customers. I wouldn't go so far as to say I'm wise, but I've been around long enough that hopefully I've got some useful experience to share. I'm looking forward to sharing that here on the call today as well. Well, I'm looking forward to it too. And we met down in Galway at an event, um, sort of middle of last year, and um, it was really interesting to hear that you had spent, you know, obviously a long time in Cisco. I'd come out of Amazon, and again, I'm bringing some of my trade into the. Um, uh in, into the tech and the scale-ups and i think you're doing similar so it'd be very interesting to understand but look we've got people on the uh registered on the call today some yeah. product managers i'm encouraging people to put questions in if you hear something you like or you want to comment on please ask a question i also encourage you to connect with eric uh if you're um, not connected with me connect with me if you don't want to ask a question and want to ask us something or follow up with us later please do that's what that's why we do this on linkedin so Absolutely. um eric just in terms of Product management. Firstly, just let's get back to basics. What is product management? Why is it important? Sure. Yeah, it's it, it's a great question and one that's actually not in some ways so easy to answer. Um, so product management is one of these disciplines that actually varies quite widely from uh, company to company, um, even within you know well-established and, and uh, big multinational firms like Cisco and Norta, where I've worked. But also I've noticed this as I work with uh, my, my SME clients, right, and startups and so forth. Obviously startups product probably don't have a product management function, but pretty much every company has the need to direct the product or the service that they're delivering to their customers. What is that product? What is the value proposition? How are you differentiating that? And assuming that you're building this product or service, that you're developing it, what should you develop, all right? And that is one of the fundamental roles of a product manager is to be that person that helps lead the direction of the product, that sets out the longer term vision, that determines the types of customers you're targeting, the value proposition you want to provide, and then you know really makes the hard calls of um, there's always more that we want to do than we than we can deliver in a given frame of time. Uh, and that's certainly, you know, it was true in big companies, but certainly true in smaller companies uh, as well. And making those priority trade-off calls is really one of the key fundamental things. Um, so it's uh, difficult to necessarily define it, but I'd look at it as really a discipline that helps to find that product direction and work with engineering and customers to deliver value at the end of the day. 
so that the company can be profitable. Okay, no, that's interesting. And when you say, you know, as a startup, it doesn't necessarily have a product management function, but the startup right. is all about product market fit. So right. whoever's building product, the engineer, normally it's the engineering team that kind of start and say, right, well, this is the thing we're building. Exactly. Here's the big problem we're trying to solve. They then go and get some funding. And then they start moving through the various series of scale up and they start bringing sales folks in and then the product matures. Um, and I think that's that maturity stage where you said the disciplines need to come in. So I think that's that that's quite quite interesting. So I suppose the disciplines. I mean, you would have picked up a lot of that through your time at, at Cisco and obviously working mm -hmm. in in the corporate space. What what sort of disciplines or what what um, you know what are you bringing from the big tech space kind of that you find is really landing with your clients at the moment or with companies that are starting to move into that scale up phase? Yeah, I, I, it's, a, it's a great question. And obviously things are, are different. At the same time, even though a company is large, they work, you know, on one product at a time, same as everybody else, right? So, uh, and typically there is a product manager that's responsible for that one product. So at that scale, it's maybe not that different. But I think the most important thing that, that I'm bringing to my customers and my clients is that experience of sort of the best practices in the industry, if you will. Um, so you, you just mentioned it, and we, I mentioned it in the in the preamble as well. When a company is starting out, the founders are really doing the product management job, right? They're defining what they should build, whom they should build it for, which bits they build first. They go and interact with customers. They get feedback. They build the next bits. That's a product management job, in you know, in some sense of the of the word. But what? The product management discipline brings to that is the best practices. So how do you analyze your addressable market, for example? What's your total addressable market? What are the analysis you do, do for that? Many of the startup programs that, come, that the smaller companies go through and are run by the likes of NRDC and Platform 94 is running a scaling program at the moment, for example, here in Galway. Many of these startup programs encourage the companies to go through these processes of looking at who exactly are my customers? How many of them are there? Where do I find them? What is their primary problem? How do I address it? How do I differentiate myself? So it's really bringing the tools and tricks to do that. And then at the, at the sort of the level below that is, how do I get my engineering team to now implement that? Once I move beyond the, I'm coding it myself in my garage or uh, you know, my mate and I, I'm doing the sales and, and he or she is doing the development. Um, and, you know, we're communicating all the time because you know, we're, we're living in each other's ear and getting this, this thing done. Once you move beyond that and you've got a handful of engineers working on the product, how do you divide out the work? How do you empower them to work on what's most important without having to micromanage them, and free up your own bandwidth? So that's all about requirements management, about prioritization, about <clears throat> the best practices of how do you document the requirements in a simple, succinct way um, so that they can you know, do the coding or whatever it is. Typically, I work with software-oriented companies, so that's where I probably mm -hmm. talk a lot about coding and software. Um, but it could be you know, equally applicable to other lines of products, more physical type products, which these days often have software components as well. So it's really that sort of managing that product lifecycle. Um, and then you know, one of the things we might get into as well is, well, what's the product direction? So you, know, you mm -hmm. mentioned achieving market fit. That can take quite a while to find and to fine tune. But even then, where, you know, where do you go? Should you do a different product? Should you do a next generation? Mm -hmm. Where do you bring it? What are the adjacencies or the next set of customers that you can bring it to? So it's all those kinds of questions as well that come into the product management role at the more strategic level. Okay, and that's it's, it's quite interesting because you, you, you're talking about, you know, the founders focus on the product and they have a really good idea of what they want to solve. And then as they move to scale up, they're bringing in the structure. So they're bringing in the product manager. So this is this engineering team that's kind of worked very closely around the product, now suddenly working with a different team. Um, and I sometimes see friction there. I mean, you, you probably see it. I'm, I'm, be, I'm, be, I'm being polite. When I, I'm being polite when I say <laughs> friction. But um, you, you, you find that what happens is product is very tightly coupled with engineering early on in the business. But as that business scales, like you say, particularly in a, a larger tech company, those products 
of the, the, the various products actually become separate businesses. Mm -hmm. So what happens is product actually starts aligning very closely with the business and where that's going into new territories. Um, and that creates a divide because you, the, the business still wants to, they may develop a number of different products, but they still want to keep that central engineering function. And now suddenly you've got a CTO having to really manage multiple work streams. Um, mm -hmm. And from, from very demanding product managers, I suppose, that want um, the best of all the engineering resources all the time. How do, you, how do you manage that or how do you help clients navigate through that, particularly as product starts rolling up into the, into the, 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 the business side of the organization and mm -hmm. tech remains in the tech side? Yeah, no, it, 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 it's one of the, the fundamental challenges, I think, at company scale. And it's one of the fundamental challenges in the discipline of product management and, and working, as you say, with engineering. Um, the same challenge can exist, by the way, on the other side with sales, right? So um, everybody always wants more, whether it's the, you know the CEO or the MD of the company that wants the thing to move faster or have more features, or for that matter, the customer, right? That, waiting on their favorite feature. Um, and the same with the product manager. So that, that is often a source of friction, or um, it could be that the product manager thinks that he or she has done a great job in telling the engineering team what they want. And then somewhere down the line, something comes back and it's nothing like what was expected, right? It falls short of expectations. So the main thing is really, again, coming back to sort of the best practices, which are difficult to summarize because it's really, you know, many different stages, but it's about having product management and engineering truly work on a partnership basis and figuring out the tools, the methodologies by which they do that. So some of that is how you share the requirements, but, you know, one of the big sort of changes, I suppose, in the discipline and especially in the software world is, in the old days, people are probably familiar with waterfall methodologies, right? Yeah. So a product manager would have written the requirements, a PRD, a product requirements document, would go on for pages and be like a big telephone book in some cases. And then you throw it over the wall and engineering go, oh, you know, they have a few questions and they go away for six months, right? And something wrong comes back. Like Hopefully nobody's working like that anymore. There are some industries, highly regulated hardware type industries um, where the waterfall approach is essentially still necessary but for the most part companies are adopting lean methodologies and practices and that's all about taking small steps learning from that turning that around and that's really the key for product management and engineering working together is to have those regular reviews typically these days companies are doing agile software development they're doing you know Two week type sprints, but in the sprint, there's a review, there's an acceptance, and you know, there's a backlog that's managed and maintained. That's not to say that you know that's gonna solve all the frustrations that, that may arise, but but that's really the key is to make sure that there's a partnership. The other thing that I think is really key, and this is a mistake I see often happen both in large and small companies, um, as a product manager comes in, they become the interface to the customer, right? They're the voice of the customer into engineering. And sometimes that can lead to engineering being distant from the customer and actually losing sight of the problem they're trying to solve. So the problem they're trying to solve is the requirements they were given without perhaps understanding why they're solving that, what they're actually solving for the customer. And okay. it's easy to get into that mindset, but it's so important um, for, engineers on the ground to actually really be familiar with the customer and their problems and know yeah. deep down what problem they're trying to solve. The, engine, the product manager can help specify and then, you know, scope the boundaries because we don't want silver plating and gold plating and we want to prioritize it the right way. But they shouldn't have to specify every nitty gritty detail down to the last, mm -hmm. you know, pixel and, and behavior um, because that's just not productive. Right, and it also it leads to misalignment. So having the engineers understand the problem that they're truly solving, having some exposure ideally to customers directly. I was actually just last week sitting down and mentoring a significantly growing company and having this exact conversation about how valuable it can be to have your engineers stand up and do product demos to customers and get that mm -hmm. feedback directly. 
many engineers are uncomfortable with that, but it's a great learning experience for them. And it gives that direct connection from engineering to to the customer and the problems they're solving. And you know that, that can be game changing. I feel for the engineers because the sales teams are pulling them into customers to demo and then the product teams are pulling them in to go and get customer feedback. So yeah. they're being pulled in different directions. Plus they've got to deal with all the Slack messages that come in and and get those those headphones. Right. And fix all those bugs, right? <laughs> and, and, and get the get the coding done. So they, they are being pulled yeah. in different directions. So you can understand the friction. Um, it's interesting what you, talk, you you were talking about waterfall and agile and actually both playing nicely together. I completely mm -hmm. agree with you in, in the business context and Again, you know, when I advise scale ups, it's all around making sure that that North Star is crystal clear. You right. can then start connecting in some OKRs or objectives and key results, which seems to be the the, the common way of goal setting now. Um, and if you've got some very high level good OKRs that everybody in the organisation understands, uh, mm. you get you get that context, and I think that helps companies. But but on OKRs, and quite an interesting one, and just to sort of um, feed my curiosity and your experience, sure. maybe if you've if you've worked. Where should the OKRs sit? And should engineering have their own OKRs and product have different? Or should engineering align to product OKRs? So this might divide a few people and I'm sure we might get a few questions in, but yeah, do you have yeah, any yeah. views on that in terms of goal setting? Should the goal, the business goal, product own that goal and then engineering sort of works almost as a, a service provider into that? Or, or should engineering carry slightly different goals? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so within Cisco, um, we certainly use the OKRs. I wouldn't necessarily say that we always applied the best practice, um, but um, they're the OKRs were a lot about sort of high level business goals and obviously revenue and margins and all that sort of good stuff. Uh, I think the most important thing you said, Alan, was right at the beginning of, of that, that statement when you talked about OKRs, which is that they should align to that North Star. They need to align to the, the problem you're really solving for the customer and the metric that indicates that success. It could be revenue, but it could, you know, it could be other things. Revenue is just, just one element. And obviously, once you start putting metrics on things, you need to be careful that they don't just become games, right? We're, we're motivated to meet the metric, but we, we want to design metrics in such a way that they're meaningful and tied to the actual outcomes we're trying to achieve. Right? That it, 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 the outcome that counts, it's not the metric, right? So the metric yeah. has to be very carefully chosen. So I, I think my advice would be that you need some overarching OKRs, objectives and key results, mm -hmm. aligned to that overall direction that tell us whether we're being successful. But then the contribution that different teams make to that are going to be different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how that OKR or how the key result perhaps breaks down. So the objective might be the same, but the key result could be different for a salesperson that needs to go and make, you know, 20 sales calls in a week or a month or whatever it is, versus an engineer that needs to execute on some part of the backlog or, you know, improve quality by some margin because it's been identified that quality is not where it should be and it's... Yeah. It's impacting the customer experience, as an example. Um, so I think each of the teams need their own relevant metric in relation to the OKRs, but it needs to tie back to, the, to that common outcome. Okay, so the key results could vary slightly depending on the team and mm -hmm. you know, also what that team needs to do in terms of activity. So sales might have a lot of leading type of indicators to hit that key result. Right. Um, a lot of activity-based work, whereas um, um, engineering might wait for the you know for, for product to de to develop the product, see how the customers are engaging or interacting with that product, and then mm -hmm. it goes into a cycle. Um, yeah. So, in terms of yeah, again, uh, I suppose we can, maybe we get into a couple of war stories shortly. But in terms of um, the structure, like w w what would you say the fundamental in terms of bringing discipline in um, and and some of the structure mm -hmm. we've spoken about goal setting. What other areas around product lifecycle management would you recommend that you've taken from from your experience over the years that that you kind of, kind of advising your clients on at the moment? Sure, um, I, I think that sort of the two fundamental components, if you will, as it relates to product management, are probably around backlog and roadmap. Right, and they're they're kind of linked, but there are different levels. Um, roadmap tend to have um, 
bad name. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> we can probably all tell war, war stories about roadmaps because they're often pieces of fiction in terms of what we'd like to happen, all right? And then if we go out and give that to the sales teams, for example, and you know those become promises to customers, but we can't deliver on them, or, or you know we, we fail to deliver on them, they move out, or they don't live up to expectations. Then that's a very bad cycle to get into, and generates a lot of stress and anxiety in the organization. Um, <clears throat> so let, let's sort of keep going on the theme of roadmap for a moment, and I'll come back to backlog. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm just to interrupt. I quite you, you said a word there, pieces of fiction in the roadmap, <laughs> and I'm quite I'm quite interested in that because obviously we all we all want to be able to predict as much as possible and and right. have an outcome and know that we've got all this code that we can build, mm -hmm. all these this bits of hardware that we can put together. That ultimately it isn't fiction, and you, yep. you're trying to you, you're trying to almost manifest a, a reality. So I'm quite interested in in the roadmap stuff there now. Yeah, indeed. So. Um... There isn't necessarily one best practice, but one practice I'm very fond of and that I think works well for many companies, particularly ones that are doing more a lean methodology, applying agile principles, is a now, next, later structure. And what that means is, what are the things that I'm working on now? So these are the features and capabilities that I'm very confident I'm going to deliver because Engineering is working on them now, and therefore we have them sized, we understand what it's going to take, and I can tell you they're going to be available at the end of next month, as an example, all right? Um, then there's the next, okay? So I've already decided, because engineering are implementing this set of features, I've already, as a product manager and as a business, made decisions about what features I want to work on next. I'm developing requirements, I'm talking to my lead customers to make sure I'm, I'm doing the right things. So those are next. So I have, a, I have a good certainty that they will come. I have less certainty about exactly when they will come because I haven't been fully sized, right? Uh, but I'm bucketing my roadmap now. And this could be monthly, quarterly, two monthly, whatever works for the organization. It depends on the scale of the, the chunks we want to do. And then there's later, right? There's everything else. It's like, there are all these other things that we would like to do that we may get around to. And ideally, that's a prioritized list, right? And they need to be at a certain level of, I say features, but of course, we really should be talking in terms of benefits rather than features, right? So customer outcomes. Uh, but it's easier to think of it as features, but it's a trap we all fall into, right? We write the feature. What we should be writing on these roadmaps is the customer outcome, the problem we're solving for them. Right. And then the, the way that that gets implemented, especially for those things in the later stage, well, we haven't even decided how to how to necessarily do those yet. And those are the things that may move around, right? So as I'm delivering now and I'm starting to engage with customers on what was next, right? Um, they may be telling me that, oh, that's really good, but I also need this other thing, or I'm going to close a big deal if I can get this other thing. And suddenly the thing that was well down the list on the later list should move up, right? And that's the flexibility, right? That's where your roadmap stays agile. The other thing that's very useful to combine with that is the idea of themes. So, you know, rather than just delivering a set of benefits, let's say benefits rather than features, so we don't get ourselves confused, mm -hmm. which are now, which are next, and which are later, we may choose to have a set of different categories. So there may be, let's say, a customer onboarding experience is really important that is smooth because there's a lot of complicated setup and we lose customers in this, in this and we want you know free trial periods and deliver lots of value in that free period so that they'll you know pay us an ongoing fee or whatever that might be. So that onboarding could be a theme, right? Um, there might be an element of reporting. So there's some activity that I'm doing uh, within the product, um, and then I want reports on it, right? I want to know what are the outcomes, did I achieve my business objectives, did it do what I thought it would do, et cetera, I give management oversight, whatever it might be. So reporting might be an entire theme in the roadmap, okay. right? And then okay. you can go a step further um, and just start getting into backlog and prioritization. And you can start making business decisions now about, okay, I want to spend 
for the next two or three quarters, let's say 25% of my effort on onboarding because I've noticed through our SaaS metrics that we're losing a lot of people in the onboarding cycle um, or, you know, we're not getting new people on board after we've helped them with the onboarding process because it's complicated and big hurdle. So we want to simplify that. So let's take 25% of our R&D investment, of our software engineering investment, put that into onboarding, right? And write a now, next, later roadmap for that. And you might do that for other, and these wouldn't be that many themes, you know, you shouldn't really have more than three or four. Yeah. Um, but it's a good way to start structuring the roadmap and start thinking about different aspects of the product. And that can help you with the prioritization then, right? Because prioritizing this important onboarding feature versus this important reporting feature could be very difficult, yeah. right? Could fill your entire bucket with all the onboarding stuff and get nothing done on reporting. That's probably not the right answer. Um, <clears throat> so, so the backlog then is really the next level down beyond below that roadmap. So the, these should be linked, um, and it's it's very important that a well structured backlog is maintained. And if that can be linked to these themes, for example, that can help with prioritization. Um, that can help with investment decisions because now I may have made an investment decision to say, okay, over the next six months, we're spending 25% of our effort on onboarding. Therefore, we've got a good size bucket for that. So, you know, let's let's do the prioritized yeah. list. Um, so so that that's really the, the key thing, right? And then the other thing that that hopefully does is we talked right at the start about the potential friction between engineering and product management they should be able to know that the now stuff shouldn't change. You know, it's mm -hmm. very expensive to change stuff that is halfway through development, right? Yeah. The next stuff should be 100% locked at the time that the execution starts and you kind of tweak it before that. But that means you got to be defining the next stuff in a lot of detail and have that backlog completely documented before the now stuff finishes, right? Because the next becomes now at that point and is very expensive to change. Whereas the later stuff, you should be able to move that around and nobody in engineering yeah. should get upset about that. They should know okay. that those things are expected to move. All right. Yeah, that's, um, it's an interesting way to frame that and it's it, you've simplified it, which is really nice. I mean, I know there's a lot of complexity in this, True. Um, but, but you, and I'd say, you know, we've got a few project product managers on, on the line at the moment. Um, the, re the reason we're not getting questions is obviously we've answered everything and we're doing such a good job of answering this or my stream yard is broken and I'm not getting the feed. But um, look, if no one's asking questions, that's okay. This is something that can be rewatched afterwards. Please share. If you do have questions afterwards, you can reach out. Uh, we're kind of approaching the 5.30 mark. I've got one or two more short questions, but to summarize yeah, what, sure. I'm hearing at, what I'm hearing at the moment, Eric, is, um, you know, I like the now, next, later. I mean, we used to have something years ago. I mean, when I was working on, on IT infrastructure projects and development, software development projects, I'm talking mm -hmm. early 2000s, which was, you know, the must have, could have, should have, won't have. Right. And trying to put things in different uh, buckets there. So I think the now, next, later is, is good in terms of now is what you must have and you're working on it. And yeah. then making sure that engineering teams know that they're not going to get unsettled or derailed on a now thing. And I think that's, Interesting, because in a startup, an early stage startup, that founder's coming with 100 ideas a day. They're a visionary. Like they're there. They're mm -hmm. going to be telling an engineer, ah, come on, you could just do this, right? Yeah, yeah. But as you get to scale up and you get investment and you start implementing teams in different territories to sell this product, that needs to settle down. And being able to sort of create those buckets of now, next, um, later makes, makes sense. I mean, I've got a similar th thing around retrospectives. Um, mm -hmm. and asking questions around stop, start, continue, which is another three-point thing, but it's also when you're getting feedback, like what what should we start doing? That's a good way to, I suppose, envisage a new idea or a new feature in terms right. of getting feedback into the product team. But that's been very beneficial, I suppose. Okay, so you, you, you're you working with a scale-up. You're probably going to leave that scale-up in a better state than it was when you started, right? Okay. Hopefully. Well, that's what we all try to achieve. That's the idea. But, um, and, and, and probably with a good product manager that's been hired into the role. So what? just to wrap up, I mean, what would be the one little bit of advice that you would give to a new product manager entering into a scale-up, probably the first PM-type role mm -hmm. that's now going to be working with the engineering team? What, what 
few little bit of nuggets of advice would you give them before you hand over and, and move on to your next client? Yeah. Um, so the scenario I think you said was a sort of relatively new product manager or new into the role at least. Uh, <clears throat> so first thing is, you know, right back to the start of this conversation, make sure you're partnering with engineering. You know, you're, you're not the boss of them. You're not telling them what to do. You're partnering with them to solve customer problems. Right. And that's that would be the other part of, of the advice that we give all customers really is make sure you stay close to the customers and they're really learning from them. So that you're, you're really ideally adopting that sort of lean methodology of build, measure, learn, right? And the shorter you can make that feedback cycle, the better. It's, it's back to the waterfall example, right? If it takes me three months to write a PRD and take six or nine months for it to get implemented on a year down the road before I learn anything. Mm -hmm. More than likely what I will learn is that a lot of what was delivered was not that relevant to customers. That's what history yeah. tells me, right? If I can do the same thing in a month, right? I can do it 12 times in a year instead of doing it one, right? And so staying close to customers, working on that iterative cycle, making sure you're building in the feedback loops, and that you're partnering with engineering, they understand the problems you're solving, they understand why you're yanking their favorite feature, you know, this new cool architectural thing that made something possible, but you don't want to build it, right? Like they need to understand why not. You probably do want to build it, but not the most mm -hmm. important thing on the list. That's a typical scenario. So having those open conversations and making sure you're partnered bringing the customer perspective into all of those conversations that, that i think is the most important thing and that's probably a good way to end off i suppose the partnership and making sure that you are partnering with with the various teams and um, when you're moving from that that startup into a scale up there is going to be structure and there are going to be lots of teams i did a post the other day around communication silos and they exist yeah. and they happen and i'm Absolutely. sure you would have seen this you would have seen this in big tech i mean as much as we try to be cutting edge um Silos exist and they're not fun and yeah. um, they can really slow progress down. So, Eric, I really appreciate the time. And uh, um, as I said, you're based down in Galway, but you probably can work globally like myself as well. Um, yeah. You're uh, involved with Scale Platform uh, 94, are a great, great organization down in Galway. And um, I've, I've done a little bit of work with them myself and yeah. uh, also doing really investing in, in getting companies ready to scale internationally. So it's great to hear that you're working with them. and. Uh, I encourage everybody on this call today and anybody that watches this afterwards to connect in with Eric, ask him questions, reach out, um, hire him, bring him in. I'm sure he can help with some of your challenges. And uh, and I really enjoyed it. I've learned a lot myself. I think you've helped me simplify some of the, the challenges I see in, in, in some of the customers I'm working with as well. So I really appreciate the time. And uh, yeah, thanks. Enjoy the rest of the day. Yeah, thank you very much, Alan. And uh, thanks everyone for watching. It's been a pleasure to be here. So. Uh... Look forward to following up with some folks. Brilliant. Take care.